Okay, so, uh, so I'm Kevin Ward, and you've heard a bit about me. Um, thank you for inviting me here today. Uh, thank you to all those at the IRS that made this uh, possible and make it happen. Uh, and I'm delighted to be here today to give the 10th International Lecture on Society and Space, uh, and I'm honoured to follow in the footsteps of various other luminaries who have uh, preceded me uh, in giving their thoughts at the IRS. Um, so today, uh, my talk um, draws upon a programme of research uh, in which I've been involved for just over five years. Uh, it's an empirical uh, research programme uh, involving a range of methods, um, archives, or, uh, ethnographies, participant observations and semi-structured interviews. But I guess, like most empirical, I think good empirical research programs, uh, it's involved an awful lot of conceptual and methodological reflection. So uh, what I'm going to present today, I think, is the latest way that I've begun to think about some of the things I've found through this project, but also as part of this broader conversation with a group of people across urban studies. So involving people in architecture, history, geography, sociology, bits of anthropology, bits, bits of political science, so they're not much, have all begun to think about the ways in which we might understand bits of the city and the world. So in a sense, it's, a, it's an attempt, mine and the wider intellectual project, to think about the ways in which some of the things we might see and study on its own terms might be connected to wider patterns of transformation. Uh, and I realise then, in saying that, I'm making a leap of faith because not everyone who theorises believes that that's the way about you go about studying things. And we can maybe talk about that later. Um, at various stages in today's talk, there will be photographs in the background. Some of them are important, and some of them are just nice to look at. This is a nice to look at photograph. Um, if it's important, I will draw your attention to it. Um, and it's not a quiz where you have to guess whereabouts in the world it is, although there might be one somewhere in there. Okay, so I plan to speak for about 35 or so minutes, although I've given slightly, I've given earlier versions of this and it always takes me way too long, so I should try and rein myself in. So I'm going to start with this. Um, so it's a bit of a cliche to talk about the urban century or the urban age. Uh, but nevertheless, I'm not going to spend much time talking about it today, um, this broad literature that involves contributions from academics, activists, think tanks, consultants, governments, local and international in scope, is obviously heterogeneous. There are a number of different ways in which even all that work that buys into this notion of the urban age or the urban century is slightly more nuanced or some of it is slightly more clunky. I guess the overall picture though is one we're probably all familiar with but it's worth reminding ourselves about which is the kind of global context of thinking about the current urban condition, which is all about the number of people across the world, the planet, and where they live. And then where they live and how that matters to other broader relationships. So it's most simple, it's simply about more people living in cities. We won't get into how we understand a city. And more people living in more bigger cities. That's okay, and there are people doing interesting work on that and modelling it in various ways. I guess I'm not interested so much in that. I'm partly interested in what that means qualitatively for the restructuring of relationships between cities that we can talk about in an urban age or an urban century. And I guess secondly, I'm also interested, and this tends to draw people's attention to a particular set of cities in a particular part of the world, which I think is really important. But I'm interested in, I guess, slightly smaller cities and cities in which the challenge is not necessarily about growing, but about how you manage deindustrialization or reindustrialization. So, what are the challenges in facing those cities that first experienced urbanization and industrialization? So, those cities of the global north. Not because I don't think there's some really interesting challenges about cities in the global south, it's just not my area of expertise. And secondly, I would argue that in the kind of global urban conditions we find ourselves in, the notion of comparison is increasingly important, i.e. dismantling the notions of the global south and the global north through these kinds of projects. Nevertheless, I thought I would just start with that. Um, 
So my modest contribution is trying to think about these two challenges that I would argue face industrialised cities. Um, and at its core, really, it's thinking about agency, the capacity of cities, wherever they are in the world, to do things, to make a difference on their own terms or on the terms set by other people, whether it be other bits of government or community groups or whatever else. Um, and again, I'm particularly interested in issues around finance and governance and the ways in which they overlap. Uh, any of you read Benjamin Barber's If Mayors Ruled the World? I'm not suggesting you do. If you haven't, stay away from it. But if you have been drawn to it, it's interesting and thought-provoking as an idea. Um, it also, I think, shows you what you can get away with by avoiding academic literatures, because in political science and public administration, there's an awful lot of work about mayors. And actually, Benjamin Barber avoids most of that, which is up to him, of course, to write a very readable book about what would happen, given his argument about basically nation states being dystopian, dystopian too big, and not the right kind of geographical scale to deal with the big challenges facing cities or and the planet. So his argument is we need a global parliament of mayors, and he's already started doing this in the process. The first meeting took place, I think, in Rotterdam last <coughs> September, October. Whether you buy that argument, it's by the by. The other, but it's part of a broader conversation that's happening about the role of cities in the world uh, and thinking about the kind of challenges that the world faces and how you might best address them internationally, nationally, locally, or a city scale. And as I am particularly interested in two aspects to this, one is about finance, which is if we think about all those cities that industrialise at a particular period of time, and then de-industrialise and stroke to re-industrialise, how do you pay for this transition? I have colleagues who work on issues around low carbon, for example, and finance is a big deal about how you're going to pay for this transition or set of transitions. But also about governance. So part of the main aim of governance is the government financial process, but also secondly, this comes partly back to the, uh, Benjamin Barber and others' arguments about cities, is what is the appropriate geographical scale? in which you might affect significant change, whatever <coughs> area of policy you're particularly interested in. So I would say these are two of the big challenges. Um, and so what I want to do for the next 10 minutes or so is just to introduce one of the ways that some of the people have begun to think about how we might think about those challenges. With, relation, with reference to a set of literatures and then trying to innovate to feel creatively about what you might do with some of that work to think about essentially finance and governance in the context of redevelopment of deindustrialized landscapes or deindustrializing still landscapes. And that's just a gratuitous photograph that I took. It has no reference to the presentation. Um, so I'm going to start with a couple of quotes. Uh, just a way of kind of energising the conversation. Uh, so this is a quote by uh, Jamie Peck from a number of years ago, and he picks up on four aspects um, when we think about policy making. Um, so Jamie is not a, a political science or a public administrator or any kind of, from that walk of life, he's a, a, a political economic geographer. But he picks up on a series of tendencies in the ways in which the making of urban policy or policy in general has been restructured. So he highlights the first set of changes around consultancy firms, so public and private sector consultancy firms, and their presence in the making of urban futures, whether it be about finance or, or governments. He talks about the broadening policy readings of transnational institutions. We can think about the OECD, the World Bank, the IMF, organisations that perhaps traditionally have not always thought about the city, but have talked about nation states have increasingly turned their attention to the capacity, the generative capacity of cities. Uh, new policy, uh, policy that around think tanks. So again, there are different kinds of ways you can think about think tanks, all with different kinds of agendas. But if you think about an intellectual division of labour or knowledge, of which something like the IRS has its role to play, we can talk about think tanks as generating ideas, putting ideas out there that policy makers may or all take on board. And then professional associations and governmental, governmental agencies. So if you think about architects or engineers and planners, we were talking about urban history earlier today, 
you know, particularly from the UK, there's a long history of architects, engineers, and planners going to other parts of the world and, and the colonialism, for example, and planning and redeveloping cities. So there are professional organisations. One could argue that we have seen a proliferation of those kinds of uh, activities, particularly away from the kind of traditional professions to a broad suite of people. And then finally, policy tourism. This idea that increasing, not increasingly necessarily, because as I say, if you look at some of the history in the 1950s and 60s, one found architects and engineers and planners going on study tours. But one might see this qualitative change in the experiences of these things taking place, involving a wider range of people go to a range of places. So if one goes to Amsterdam to look at how you design a cycle-friendly city, for example, or Freiburg, if you want to look at the kind of ecological, sustainable set of futures that you might hope to achieve. So he just draws attention to these range of changes. So I like that quote because of what work it does for us when I'm thinking about these ideas. The second, completely different intellectual tradition. So Jamie, where are you here? Would identify myself clearly as a clever economist. It's obviously been recorded. Um, I am on, I think it's fair to say, at the other end of the intellectual spectrum as a political post-structuralist. Yet she talks about, interestingly, about worldly projects. So this idea about, I mean, about the ways in which we think about the cities in the world and the ways in which power at different scales and localities, but something about urban centres, both into the generating of ideas and also being those that are on the receiving end to think about changes in the way they do things, whether it be adaptation, climate change, ageing, transport, economic development, skills, or whatever else. I like the fact these two quotes are put next to one another, and I like the fact they come from different intellectual traditions, but they can be folded into one another when we think about these sorts of issues. So, there are lots of different ways of thinking about worlding. Um, like some of these terms that emerge in human geography and planning, they have a long set of intellectual histories. Uh, in particular, the notion of worlding comes from philosophy, cultural studies, subaltern studies, it's the work of Spivak. I guess my use and the use that has begun to be taken, used, the way in which the term has begun to be used, is a slightly more mundane and ordinary way, I think. Uh, that's not to say this work on worlding is still not going on in those areas, particularly around subaltern studies, but mine is much more uh, grounded, which is literally, and figuratively and literally, the ways in which cities in the world and the world is in the city. So we can think about, we had a conversation about migration, for example, the ways in which people populate cities. So we can think about the city being in the world, like Berlin or Manchester. Um, I have a colleague in Manchester who you know, has done a study and Manchester as a city is home to two or three hundred different languages. That surprises people from Manchester and from outside Manchester. We can, we can think about cities in that way. We can think about other ways in which the world begins in those places. Think around culture, for example, or not only languages, uh, consumption habits. So lots of different ways in which the world is in the city and the city is somehow out there in the world. My particular take on it, and the work that's been going on in this area, is to try and think about the ways in which uh, the city, the landscape, the built environment, is shaped by ideas and expertise and knowledge that comes from elsewhere. So that when you walk around a city, whatever city that is, you can see the imprint, uh, the residue, the leftovers of ideas that have been thought about in terms of redevelopment. So we can think about some examples, so CCTV cameras, increasing securitisation of the built environment that has a long tradition to it in different some contexts more than others, but again, increasing amounts of time, uh, increasing examples of the ways in which this set of technologies has found itself being introduced in cities around the world. We can think about a smart city as perhaps the most extreme example. We think about which Florida, the creative city. The smart city is almost everywhere. It's ubiquitous. Um, How has it come to be that almost every city government seems to want to claim to be doing smart as opposed to dumb or stupid urbanism? What does it actually mean in those terms? And other things around waterfronts and ports I'm going to talk about and redesigning uh, the built environment. Um, what does that, what, how does that come about? What does that say about the ways in which architectural styles and designs or zoning or paying for stuff finds itself being moved around in a way that shapes 
in a very tangible material sense the city, partly because of the influences from elsewhere. So for me, as I say, it's not a particularly, particularly uh, highfalutin or abstract concern. When I think about well, this is what I think about. And it gives me a hand in the way of thinking about what I see when I look out my window or when I read about other people's work in other cities around the world. Okay. So if we, but, but, of course, nevertheless, even though it's very literal, um, we can still break it down into a set of tendencies. So these are, I'm going to identify five changes that I think are important when we think about the ways in which the city in the world, the world in the city. I'm just going to whiz through them, I'm not going to spend a lot of time, and in some senses I have a longer standing interest in some of these things than others. And I'm going to focus on two at the end and come back to them using a case study. So the kind of more abstract conceptual conversation will end in due course. So one way in which we can think about uh, the world in your cities, particularly around major policy, is the increasingly entrepreneurial and speculative forms of statecraft. That is the ways in which city, elected city government, works with, on behalf of, or outsource various bits of its functions to oversee transformations in the city. Uh, Again, in different countries, in different cities, there's a longer tradition of this big cities being entrepreneurial, even down to what we mean by being entrepreneurial. But I think we can identify some clear patterns in the ways in which entrepreneurship and the kind of speculative nature about betting on certain <coughs> futures has increased and maybe disciplines certain actors, public sector actors, for example, rendering some projects doable, financeable, others less so. I'm not saying whether that's good or bad, I'm just saying I think we can identify and there's a large literature across the social sciences on this aspect around statecraft. A second uh, tendency is the increasing inter-referencing practices that accompany the ways in which cities imagine their futures. So literally the sighting of other places, whether they be whole cities, bits of cities, parts or bits of technology. We can see cities, big and small, uh, find themselves compelled in making the cases for whatever else they're going to do in the future, indulging in inter-referencing practices. And some of that can be quite big, and some of it can be quite small in the sense of literally informally telling other people in a meeting like this, this is what I want to do, and I'm going to do it because they've done it somewhere else and it's worth there. Thirdly, modelling and making urban futures. So I love the fact that you've got the historical archive with the maps and the blueprints and the figures, just across a lost sense of where we are, but next door. Um, you know, increasing, uh, so there's one tradition, where we can think about this, the long tradition of architects making models and designing stuff, but we can also think about other ways in which econometric models or other models that use both cost-benefit analysis are used to predict urban futures with what goes with it. And we can see increases in quotes, increasingly sophisticated models that do work when we think about the world in the city. So modeling and making. So there's a kind of material aspect to this, into the real things you hold and see and touch. And they then um, encourage certain futures. And then there are other ones that are probably less tangible, less easy to understand. Two more. Fourth one, and again this does pick up on some of the work that I am closely doing, is the fact that um, notions of policy tourism. So how is it, through acts of comparison, mediation, movement and translation, how is it that uh, cities in different disparate parts of the world are being brought into line in some ways? Now, historically that's involve a certain set of power geometries between the north and the south. And I talked about British architects engineers and planners going to various bits of the world of colonialism. But we can see other examples are much more about, for example, Singapore's approach, travelling, challenging the north-south relationships that have existed. Or we can see what's been going on in Hong Kong, its redevelopment, finding itself being used in other bits of Asia or Africa. So it's not simply a case, I'm not sure if it was really, that the north was a generator of great ideas and the south and southern cities then found themselves compelled to do stuff. Actually, I think the kind of geographies are much more complicated now, facilitated by a whole range of networks. Nevertheless, there is a body of work that's trying to pay attention to the work that's been done by individuals in a very embodied sense, 
about making your policy, but actually tries to talk about this in a rather incremental, ad hoc, muddling through, rather than some of the work you read that suddenly presents a policy as fully formed, as unproblematic, and it's just suddenly arriving. And then the final bit is really about the geographer. So what happens in place? Because of course, actually, if you're making the policy, there's other stuff going on. So I'm focusing on this kind of worldly bit, but actually there's some really territorial, very grounded issues around land and ownership, for example, that are still really important, that have traditionally been the kind of intellectual bread and butter of geographers, but are still really important. So how does this other kind of retrospective sense get folded into the work that I and other people have historically done geography, which I would argue is more introspective. You know, you study a city by basically interviewing people in that city. Actually, I would argue now, if you're going to study a city, whatever city that is, you need often to go outside of the city because you find the influences of federal government, city government, regional government, national government, international government, co-present in that city in shaping agendas. Okay. So that's the framework. I will come back a couple of times to two aspects of those five tendencies. I just want to focus on two today when I talk about um, finance. So I'll say I've got, I'm not a financial geographer, um, so I got interested in financing not because that's what I thought was really interesting, and actually still I see people in the audience, and it may happen now, and that's fine if it does. I mentioned the word finance, and people's eyes glaze over, they start looking tired and bored. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to try and make finance sound interesting because what I'm actually interested in is the politics around finance. So how, and particularly, you know, if you walk around any city, sometimes you walk around Berlin, you actually don't even know how the deals have been done to make the buildings that are transforming the city. Sometimes there's a plaque. You know, the European Regional Development Fund used to have these little blue, blue plaques on cities. But sometimes that works hidden. You don't actually know what deals were done to assemble the land to make the building happen and what the consequences were. So in some sense, is that this kind of literature is trying to render that work visible and then to think about what were the decisions that were made along the way that shaped who had a say in the future. This picture does matter a bit more because this is the case that I'm going to talk about. Um, so this is, uh, I'm going to get a bit lost. It's uh, Edinburgh, but it's not Edinburgh that most people would know when you say Edinburgh. And I'll come back and talk about that in a minute. So I'm interested in, uh, you know these are Edinburgh, these are just, pictures around the world, they're all quite sunny, um, and they're all kind of ports slash waterfronts. So as I said at the beginning, I'm interested in the challenging, cha the kind of challenges that face previously or still industrialised cities, and what you do with uh, that deindustrializing or reindustrializing landscape in those places. Because there's an awful lot of cities that have a chunk of derelict or underused I mean, they're not underused often, people use them in creative ways. I guess there's just no use, there's no exchange value being generated through the relationships in the land. So what do you do if you're a city government, for example, and you're, you're left with a legacy um, of a port that once was really important, employed lots of people, generated revenue, livelihoods, intergenerational relationships, etc., etc., and then those things change. The terms and conditions change. We can still think, we can think about the same around railroads and transit-led redevelopment. Any area in cities that you're familiar with where there's a large area part of land that maybe has lots of issues around environmental cleanup, for example, so it's brownfield. What do you do in those cases? And I'm interested partly around, uh, partly for a range of reasons, around ports and waterfront. Um, so they're just some examples of the kind of, so I'm going to talk about one key study which I would see is symptomatic of the broader challenges that ports and waterfronts and their kind of governance and financing face. And a few years ago I did some work in Cleveland because that had a pretty interesting attempt to redevelop its waterfront. Okay, so that's the picture people are more familiar with when you think about Edinburgh. Um, Okay, so let me say one more thing about this. The other thing to think about ports and waterfronts, of course, is that ports are in the world. They're always in the world. They are the places where people came through, okay? They're where goods and products came through from elsewhere in the world, passed through and moved on. Where workers, seafarers, moved through. So in a sense, even in you know, like a city like here to me, Liverpool, 
it has a relationship to other parts of the world, partly through its port. So in a sense, I'm interested in that because there's a pre-existing story to be told about these locations as they're coming together of various relations and diasporas and peoples. Anyway, so Edinburgh is known for a number of things. Anyone been to Edinburgh? I'm doing this so you're all away. Oh, a few people. Very good. Okay, so if you've been to Edinburgh, you'd normally go in the centre. Uh, so it has a fringe festival. So if you haven't been, it's great. It's very busy and expensive and hard to move around the centre. And then obviously it has its castle. Um, and a lot of other bits of history, which are very nice to go and be a tourist in. Uh, and that's the bit that people tend to know about when they think about the Ed Edinburgh. Um, less well known is this. Uh, so Edinburgh is, doesn't have, uh, well, five kilometres away from the centre where you would go and see all those things. It has a waterfront. It was, there was an attempt to rename it the Edinburgh Waterfront. It didn't happen, so it remains called Leith. It's the Leith waterfront, but it's part of Edinburgh. And again, you can see the familiarity about the way it's laid out, the kind of light industrial, logistics, and dirty work. Um, you know, that's the kind of area that people don't think about when they think about Edinburgh. And the people who live in Leith, and historically live in Leith, realise that. They realise that they are the communities that do the shitty work to get stuff into Edinburgh that then maintains that centre of the veneer of the centre. And there's a longer kind of political set of relationships between the communities that live on the waterfront of the port and those that live in, in the centre, which I can talk about more if people are interested. Okay, I'm going to go back to a couple of quick quotes again. So I think, how do we think about deindustrializing landscapes and ports in waterfronts? I'm going to go back to two quotes. One's an academic, and one's not. And hopefully you realise that the academic one is the Lady Harvey quote. And this is the Edinburgh City Council quote. So this is one where Harvey is trying to talk about, again, thinking about political agency in the world of cities. You know, there are two ways, extremes of thinking about cities in the world when it comes to finance. One is they're all dupes. That finance calls the tune and cities can't do much more than do what they need to do. The other is that somewhere, some cities are able to make and get concessions from global finance. They can use the money in progressive ends. He's basically trying to look at the ways in which the negotiations take place between international capital and the local powers. And his argument actually is, because this is David Harvey, this is his view of the world, we're all doomed. Uh, and uh, you know, basically, the best that city governments can do is to try and find ways of pulling in capitalist redevelopment. Which basically means interurban competition. So money that's coming into Berlin is not going to Hamburg or Frankfurt or London or wherever else in the world it could go to. Because that's his view. So that's one interesting point. And the other is a quote from a document which I'm going to come back to in Edinburgh, where it basically talks about uh, the brown the waterfront as being a significant development opportunity. So the language is interesting because it's about packaging and parceling a chunk of land and the livelihoods and the communities as a development opportunity. About vacant, I'll use brown from there. It's also about urban design and sustainability. So it's partly around thinking about literally designing a new set of, uh, or in this case, villages for the communities in this part of uh, Edinburgh. Of course, there were always pre-histories. So uh, I, did some archive, I did some archival work to try and find out a bit more about how it came to be that in the 2000s, when I was trying to do this work, uh, late 2000s, uh, Edinburgh was struggling, like many other ports and waterfronts, to redevelop its area. So here's a newspaper article, it's a horrible, it's in English, obviously, and it's a horrible play of English word, because it's calling it leaf, as in leaf in Scotland, rather than leaf as in fall off a tree. Um, and there's someone trying to dig it up. Uh, and then this one is a reference point to an area in Spain, where there was a belief in the 1990s that Edinburgh could become like the Costa del Sol, but the Costa del Fall was on the fourth page. A sense about the longer history to redevelop this waterfront area. So let me just go back to uh, interim referencing. So Edinburgh is trying to make a case in the late 2000s, having had a long history of trying to redevelop its waterfront, and it references Barcelona and Baltimore as two, area, two reference points as a way of thinking about how it might redevelop itself. 
And again, this is a relatively recent development because digging around with the archives over a number of weeks in Edinburgh, this marks a change in the ways in which Edinburgh City Government with other people thought about their futures. Because while they attempted to redevelop the waterfront, here they're in a much more clearer reference to a particular model, because both Barcelona and Baltimore are seen to have been successful. So the work of Stephen Ward, who's an urban historian, who's written about the Baltimore model and what was involved in that at that time. I'm not going to get into that, whether they're appropriate reference points. The more general thing is that one sees examples of these kind of interreferencing taking place here. That's what it looks like uh, at the moment. So, uh, again, that, you, have, you have kind of disused land, largely redundant. You have pockets of um, uh, flat developments, the, the, the private sector owners of the land developed, and then nothing else happened around. So, Edinburgh City Government are seeing this take place, and they basically decide what we need a master plan of this. So, uh, which obviously looks very different to this. So, I'm interested in how it is that. Um, you involve community groups, how you involve them in participation in co-production, and the various issues around master planning, large areas of land, where you can make a real difference to a city. So I'm not talking about small parcels, we're talking about major chunks of land where if you can put it off, and some cities have, um, you can make a real difference aesthetically, but also about the place of the city in the world, but also more locally to communities and groups and housing associations and others. So of course, Anyone who's familiar with any attempt to landscape and redevelop waterfronts or cities in general will see familiar kinds of techniques that are used to represent uh, a particular kind of future, which has a certain subject in mind. Um, and there's a lot of criticism of these kinds of documents, whether you think they're right or not. But the point is, these sorts of documents are the sorts of documents one would see in uh, the documents that get produced. Uh, around the uh, waterfronts and ports. So I thought what I was doing was a study about uh, waterfront redevelopment and master planning and the kind of politics around that. But actually it became clear that all of this wasn't going to take place because no one had quite thought through how they were going to pay for some of the upfront costs. So that's one issue. And the second issue is we're into 2007 and 2008, or just up on the other side of 2007 2008, when of course you have a global financial crisis and austerity in the UK, which basically means that you have a private sector that's increasingly risk averse and a public sector that has no resources and no money. So what do you do? So here, and I, so I was in, so I started off with two people about the master planning and went to various uh, community events and tried to get a sense about what was going on. But quite quickly, actually, the project became less about the master planning, although that's interesting, and more about the financing of it. Uh, because this seemed to be a bit of a game breaker in terms of whether it's possible. So here's a quote from someone talking a bit about uh, the situation a few years ago, where they talk a bit about the ways in which uh, the future figures in thinking about the waterfront and how that future might be costed in terms of its redevelopment. <coughs> and a second quote, where someone again talks about the meetings they went to. Um, and the ways in which developers, particularly, were risk averse. You know, they weren't prepared, even having seen the master planning and all the documents, they weren't prepared to do the kind of costs that are often incurred in any attempt to, uh, say, re-industrialise. Even the industries like industry or services or tourism or hotels, often any of that work requires some cleanup or infrastructure costs uh, to be carried at the beginning. And the question then becoming in Edinburgh was how are you going to have made this happen uh, given what was at stake? Politically, because this is a large chunk of land on the waterfront where people can see it, but also politically in the broader UK context where Scotland, Scotland's having devolution. Okay, so, and it's at that point that we have to go back in time a little bit to the late 1990s. Because actually, uh, one of the... Uh, one of the things that started happening in Edinburgh was this sense that there was a way of paying for these costs up front. 
that would not either involve the private sector paying for them or the public sector. Which to me seemed a bit of a dream that was unrealisable, but there was a sense that there was a model, a way of paying for these things that didn't involve the private sector or the public sector paying for money. And this is something called tax income and financing. I'm not going to get into the details of this. All you need to know is that, I mean, I can get into details if people ask me later on, but all you need to know for the sake of the talk right now is essentially what tax income and financing does. It's basically draw a line on a map around an area. And it says, at the moment, we collect taxes on the properties in those areas, and the, prop the taxes go somewhere else, to a, a level of government. What if we spent a lot of money in that area? What would happen to property taxes? They go up. Okay, how much would they go up? So you estimate how much they go up. What if we borrowed money to spend at the start, and then the way the taxes went up would pay down the debt? So it's a way of speculating on an urban future. It's a way of saying, if we borrow money and spend it in this kind of way, we will generate growth, and that growth, the uplift of property taxes, will pay for the debt. There is, of course, a risk. If you do all the things you're going to do and growth doesn't come about, you're left with a large debt. A number of US cities, which is where TIF came from, have found themselves not helped by the fact that they spent a lot of money and they found themselves with extra debt because the money they've spent has not delivered the growth. Anyway, you don't need to get into the detail of that. The point is, in the late 1990s, a whole host of UK policymakers and practitioners and planners and think tank people went to the US and went to Chicago to try and find out about TIF, to try and find out about the ways it had been used. So there's a big, in the UK, a big document, an urban task force, 1999, a big document, and the way it talked about its lessons it learned from elsewhere was to do postcards. A bit like a holiday. So again, it's not like policy tourism. You send a postcard to your parents, and then you know you have a good time. This is a postcard from Chicago, which kind of sets out, here's a quote from the document, about the ways in which they thought something like tax income and financing might be useful in the UK. So this struck me as interesting, because I was in Edinburgh being talked about a document in England that had been produced in the late 1990s that itself had reference points to Chicago in the mid-1990s. So I went back and spoke to various people who had been involved in those trips. So I spoke to people in the Urban Task Force. So again, I spoke to a few people over the last few hours at IRS, and the notion of biographies is important, which is why I was asking those people the questions. So I basically spent a couple of hours with people talking about their kind of preferred personal and practitioner biographies, but emphasising, trying to get a sense from them about how they found out about things elsewhere in the world, and what they did with that information and how they made sense of it in conversations on their own, however. And of course the other thing is that this is taking place in the late 1990s before the internet, or at least before the internet as we know it. So actually going to a place, seeing it, touching it, smelling it, hearing about it, is very important. I mean, you could argue it's still important now, I would argue it's important now. But anyway, so there's one quote from someone and another one talking a bit about how you made sense of it talking about Chicago, what they did when they were there, and how they went around, and what they were showing, and the discussion, discussions over dinner. So again, you know, one thinks about some of the work we read about, the ways in which policies are moved, and it appears in a very kind of dry, technocratic, here this happens, you go and hear someone talk. And actually, an awful lot of the stuff is rather hard to nail, it's ephemeral, intangible, passing, fleeting even, and the outcome of which you don't necessarily know. Certainly when I spoke to people here, they were not aware either that TIF would not be introduced when it came back into the UK in 1999, or that someone would reignite the debate 10 years later. And one final quote. So bad translation. So again, emphasising this point about the ways in which the people who make urban policy of its various shapes and sizes often, bless you, often thinking about how they try and make sense of this referencing their own experiences, trying to make sense of it in terms of what work would be required to render something that comes from somewhere else as introducible in whichever city you're interested in. And in the UK and the US there are three different legal institutional financial systems that do make some work of translation necessary. Okay, the outcome of this was this, a fairly innocuous looking 
uh, document that was produced in 2010, uh, which was a business case for the creating of a tax increment financing uh, district on the waterfront as a way of paying for uh, what they wanted to do. The bid was for 100 million euros. Uh, it was what's called enabling infrastructure. Uh, so piers, roads, uh, and in particular, everyone was interested in capturing a growing share of the cruise liner industry. So you have large ships that pull over in Edinburgh. I'm not going to ask everyone to do a cruise, but um, pulling over in Edinburgh, but actually, because of the gates they have, the boats have to be a certain size. What they want, of course, is a larger proportion of this increasingly growing market. And what they don't want to do is tourism, getting tourists getting off, getting on a coach and going to the centre of Edinburgh to the museums and the history of uh, the uh, castle. They want people to stay locally. So it's about value capture, in a sense. OK. That's how, and that's how it works. So if I didn't explain it properly the first time, we didn't get it. So City of Edinburgh Council, City, City of Edinburgh Council finances the delivery of development and regeneration, so it pays for it. Those projects deliver extra growth and private sector development. This is a bit, you know, utopia, but the mechanism, the TIF mechanism that now exists, captures the increase of these revenues. Okay. Now in England, you may not know this, but uh, England and the UK more generally is a very centralised tax system. If you're a city government in the UK, there's actually very little incentive for you doing this. Because if there's any uplift, it goes straight to Whitehall and then gets given out to everybody else. Or not, as the case may be. So what's different about Edinburgh was that it managed to negotiate a deal where it could keep some of this. So it made sense for it to risk be risky and entrepreneurial perspective because about half of the money that would be uplifted, if any was, would be kept here and the other half would flow back to the UK, Scotland or Whitehall. This wasn't the case in England. So that's why Scotland, Edinburgh, Glasgow, Aberdeen, other Scottish cities were looking to get in and create a TIF and Edinburgh was the first one to be given the OK. Okay, let me just rewind a little bit. Okay. So, I started interviewing people about the waterfront, but also to think about generally about tax income and finance, and about finances, about how they were thinking about TIF, and what they knew about it, why they knew what they knew, and what they thought that meant for the future of Edinburgh, but also more generally cities. Um, and again, coming back to those two themes that I highlighted, interrep referencing and then policy tourism, I'm going to come back to both of those two. Um, so, the 1990s document, the one I talked to you about, uh, this Richard Commissions or the Urban Task Force, was referenced. So, they were, they were aware, the people I was speaking to were trying to get together and make this project, were aware of the fact that this document had been produced in the late 1990s, that it made the argument that Chicago was a good place to learn from. Um, uh, and you know, they talk about the American experience and using the document in London and Edinburgh. So we see examples of the ways in which previous attempts to render a policy mobile were referenced by people in Edinburgh as they sought to make their own version of uh, a TIF district. Again, going back to that document, uh, the US experience was quite directly referenced. So it wasn't just Baltimore and Barcelona in terms of the kind of master planning of the waterfront. But again, uh, talking about the way in which TIF had been used and bringing together Edinburgh and Scotland more generally and the US and making the case, um, as the whole document makes the case, for the uh, scope to introduce TIF to finance this particular uh, bit of its future. So a couple of examples, one based on more qualitative, informal senses about the ways in which previous experiences had found their way into Edinburgh, and then more explicit ways in which the council had referenced uh, um, the US example. And the other of those five, the other tendency I want to pull forward, and I've already done a bit of that, is about policy tourism. Um, so people in Edinburgh not only were happy to read about and cite and reference, but they actually went to the US. They wanted to know a bit more about the ways in which the US had used tax income and financing. They didn't go to Chicago for a range of reasons. They went to California. Uh, 
I'm sure there are lots of reasons why to go to California, professional and personal. So they went to California, again, to get a sense about what worked, what didn't work, how it introduced. Of course, the irony being that as Edinburgh is thinking about introducing tax income and financing, California as a state is about to abolish TIF for a range of reasons. But nevertheless, they went to try and find out, to try and get a sense about what it worked, how it worked, what the limits were, and what they might try and do in terms of translating it into something that might be useful in Edinburgh. Finally, so think about those, ten, those tendencies. How did this matter in terms of the making of the Edinburgh tip from the waterfront? So if you think back to Jamie Peck's opening quote, he talked about the role of uh, internationalisation of consultancies, for example. So uh, PwC, Price, Waterhouse, Coopers, are, are a fairly well-known uh, global consultancy that have traditionally worked with private sector clients, but have increasingly seen the public sector and local government as potential clients to work with, particularly the UK case where more and more local government source, uh, services are outsourced and not done in-house, where you bring consultants in to do work. So pre PwC played an important role, essentially as part of a wider informational infrastructure. So if you're in Edinburgh and you've been to California, you try to find out stuff about what works and what doesn't work. And then you've got PwC, who have locations all over the world, who can bring into conversation their experts in the US, who have used TIFF in the US case study, and then bring them into conversation with what's trying to do in Edinburgh. Again, it serves to make more likely the use of something like tax income and finance. And we could argue, actually, these sorts of examples are necessary to manage the risks and anxieties of public sector work officials. Um, so that's one example. And the other example is within the people I was speaking to within Edinburgh, an increasing number were in city government or actually weren't city government officials. They essentially been seconded in by it from consultants. So Edinburgh City Council, when it looked about doing TIF, didn't feel it had the financial expertise and knowledge to ask the right kinds of questions to financiers and developers, so it seconded in people from consultancy firms who had the right knowledge and expertise and could make sense of TIF because when you've got 100, Euro, 100 million euros at stake, you don't want to be making a mistake. So this is interesting in terms of how this think, you think about the territorial nature of making a policy. Okay, so just to try and pull this together, if we go back to thinking about worlding, uh, and again, a quote from uh, Io Ong, who talks about worlding practices are those activities that gather in some outside elements and dispatch others back into the world. So we can think about the ways in which uh, there are various kind of comings and goings and flows, but also a certain sense of path dependency in the case of the UK, about thinking about the ways in which, in the case of urban policy, the world and the cities and the cities of the world. You know, the US, in the UK, we have a long tradition of looking to the US when it comes to urban matters, for better or worse. So it's not completely random that uh, in the late 1990s and the production of that document that Chicago is one of the places they went to, nevertheless. We can also think about the ways in which uh, bits of the city are projected into the world as development opportunities. So again, we can think about, I mean, Saskia Sassen, but a whole host of other people have written about this, the ways in which some bits of the city are seen to be more global than others. That can mean two things. It can be used in a rather nasty way, when we talk about migration and diasporas and difference, but it can also, in a lot in a pleasant way, but some of the other ways it's used about is as a way of promoting the city, about cosmopolitanism, for example, and difference and multiculturalism. And clearly, in Edinburgh's case, and a number of other cities, there are certain spaces and sites that are seen to be more outward looking, and there, the, the capacity to do something interesting and creative, maybe around even public art, was definitely there in the Edinburgh plan. Again, it's worth just holding on to the territorial politics. So there is no, just out of interest, there is no TIF in Edinburgh. It never came to pass. It's still on the books. And the reason it didn't come to pass was because ultimately, the city government, having done all that work, couldn't convince the landowners that they should do the necessary redevelopment. So that Edinburgh was prepared to lower the money, but the deal was that developers then had to build a certain number of houses, had to build certain hotels, had to build a certain set of retail offers. 
And actually, in the final instance, the developer, uh, the owners said, actually, we need to go down the renewables line. So Scotland's putting a lot of money behind its renewable strategy, renewable energy strategy, and that was the line it pursued. And the problem with renewables is it just doesn't generate the uplift in land value. So, in a sense, TIF couldn't take place because they were not convinced that the way they wanted to develop the land owners wanted to develop the land would generate the revenues to pay the debt. Or they were sufficiently unconvinced they were risk averse. Two, two more, two final points. One, so this is about TIF, but actually I would argue, and I started off talking about it in terms of political agency, we can see lots of examples. If you look at the UN Habitat, New Urban Agenda, there's a whole section there about finance, about subnational or metropolitan finance, and the emphasis on land value capture, or new ways of thinking about paying for stuff. And that's largely about the cities of the global south, but we can see other examples as well. So I would argue that actually, TIF is just one example, there's a whole family of them, of models about land and land ownership and what that means for generating income streams or revenue that allow you to do good or bad things depending on your views. And then finally, uh, thinking about information infrastructure. So websites, knowledge banks, business schools, uh, PowerPoint slides, the various bits and pieces that are kind of brought into being when we think about a way of being global. So Eugene McCann talks about this in a paper in uh, Annals in 2011, and I think it's incredibly important if we're thinking about what distinguishes this era, whenever it stops and starts, from previous periods that have seen study tours and architects and planners go to elsewhere you know, I've read about British planners going to Russia, Russian planners coming back to Britain and exchanging ideas about design. I would argue it's a very different kind of global condition than this. It's partly around this information infrastructure that exists. I'll leave you with that. So, uh, so you can't see it, but it says trillions of dollars in urban redevelopment is driving the renaissance of cities worldwide. Prudentials, global investment expertise can help you capitalise on this unprecedented growth. So it's old downtowns becoming new boom towns. So it's a way of thinking about how bits of cities, particularly the old downtowns, but for that we can think about a chunk of land that has certain characteristics around deindustrialization or whatever, is becoming investment opportunities. So how is this land being packaged and parcel to finances and redevelopers? And what work does city government, which is I guess my interest, play in that process of restructuring. Um, and on that I'll leave it, so thank you very much.